good evening, members. Good evening, members of the public. Uh, good evening, anybody that has joined us on YouTube. Welcome to the Planning Applications Committee on the 4th of August. Uh, slightly earlier start tonight. Um, before we go into the main agenda, uh, can I just advise members that I did um, go and see Eddie Scott uh, before he left to thank him on behalf of the committee for all his hard work. Um, there was a tray of donuts, and I resisted eating one for each of you. I just limited myself to the one, and it was very nice indeed. Um, but firstly, and now um, Ms. Simpson is looking after us, which is our chief whipper in. Um, and firstly, can we have the fire instructions, please? Um, yes, good evening. Um, there, are, there is no fire drill scheduled tonight, um, but if you do hear the fire alarm, it is a long, loud, continuous ring. Um, if it does ring, please leave the building promptly and calmly using the stairs next to the lift if possible. Um, there is a fire escape over there, but please don't use this unless it's an absolute res last resort. Uh, do not stop to gather personal belongings and please do not use the lift. Uh, if you please go down the stairs outside the building and then meet behind the theatre in the, by the Knoll Road multi-storey car park. Um, and please do not leave the assembly point until you are told it is safe to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, apologies, please. Um, we've had a apologies from Councillor Tapper. Uh, he's asked Councillor Rice to substitute for him, so I'm sure Councillor Rice will be along shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, members, um, uh, are you happy that I signed the minutes of the, uh, the last meeting? Thank you. Right. Declarations we will deal with on each item, and the first item we have tonight, I don't think there's any need for any declarations, is the uh, Planning Enforcement uh, Performance um, Report. Can I remind members that we will be dealing with the public element of this report, uh, we will be going into um, confidential at the end of the general items, and um, uh, who's taking this one? Right, Ms Greenfield, would you like to talk us through it? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, I'd like to provide you with an update on the team's performance since I last reported to this committee in April. So reporting for the period the 25th of uh, March until the 30th of June, during this period we received 51 new referrals as opposed to 48 in quarter one. The highest number of referrals relates to the Windlesham and Chopham area, which are eight, um, followed by Bisley and West End with six. The most common allegation related to un um, unauthorised uh, development is 23. During this period of time, we've issued four enforcement notices um, relating to one middle close in Camberley, Chopham car spares in Clearmount Chobham, Four Oaks Nursery in Hyams Lane, Chobham, and land to the east of Four Oaks Nursery, also in Hyams Lane in Chobham. All four, no all four notices have been appealed and are currently with the Planning Inspectorate for determination. As detailed in my report, the service has struggled due to lack of resource during this quarter. 
During the period in question, uh, three temporary contractors have left, and since writing my report, the Senior Planning and Enforcement Officer has resigned and left the Council. On a positive note, I'm pleased to confirm that two contractors are starting this coming Monday. They will provide much needed resource and resilience uh, until a permanent structure has been agreed and implemented. The knock-on effect from the resourcing issues has meant that uh, little compliance work has been carried out and the uniform project has not progressed any further. I would like to provide members with assurances that both of these matters will be priorita prioritised as soon as is practical. I'd like to finish my update on a positive note. Uh, despite the challenges we have faced during this quarter, I'm pleased to confirm that the team have exceed the, exceeded the 80% target are set out in the key performance indicators. This is where the initial action takes place within the timescale set out on the uh, in the local enforcement plan. Uh, the timescales are two working days for a high priority case, 10 days for a medium priority case, and 21 days for a low priority case. Um, that concludes my update, and I'd like to take any questions from, from members, should they have any. Thank you very much. Members, do you have any questions on that part of the report? No? No? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, we then go on to the main part of the agenda, uh, item two on page 29, uh, Solstrand Station Road Bagshot. Um, declarations, there was a site visit on this one. Thank you very much, Mr. Tony, for organising that. Uh, and um, I uh, have been contacted. I imagine everybody else uh, had correspondence in relation to this item. Uh, are there any other declarations to make? Councillor White? I've had meetings with residents regarding this application. Presumably you've come here with an open mind. I come here with an open mind. I don't wish to put words in your mouth, but you'll confirm that. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor uh, Gordon. Same as Councillor White, I've had a meeting with residents regarding this application, and I also come here with an open mind tonight. Thank you very much. Any other declarations? No. Um, and Ms Turney, you... Yeah, Ms Turney, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good, good evening, members. So the proposed application seeks planning permission for the demolishment of an existing dwelling and all, as oh, there it is. And all associated build buildings and structures, the erection of three detached three-bedroom dwellings and associated parking, <coughs> refuse storage, collection point and landscaping. Take note of the updates as I go through the slides. The site is located within the settlement area of Bagshot in close proximity to the station. The application site is outlined in red and is L-shaped. The surrounding area is mainly detached dwellings of varying plot sizes. To the east of the site is the residential gardens and the railway line. Here. Railway lines here. To the west is the residential gardens that front Bridge End Road. So these are the ones that are here. To the south of the site is a block of flats. Also currently under construction is the development at Queen Anne House, which is the plot up to the top here. The land levels change on the site and the land slopes downwards towards the south or to the rear of the site. As I move on to the next slides, they'll show photos of the site that will explain this in more detail for those of you that weren't able to make the site visit. The site context and the level changes on the site is important to this application. The the existing dwelling on the site is located to the front and is in poor state of repair. The images show the neighbouring properties to the west, so these are the ones fronting Bridge End Road. And then this is the image here where your Queen Anne's house is currently under construction. The neighbours on this boundary have greenhouses and large outbuildings which form a hard, hard up to the boundary within the site. So this can be seen in this rear, in the bottom image here, um, part of that site is large outbuildings on the boundary and then these images at the rear at the bottom also start to show that the land level starts to decrease so these are some further images that show the site context um, so this is the rear section of the site the site slopes downwards um, as mentioned and is on a lower land level to the front um, 
And the buildings you can see here are to the rear are also on a lower land level. So these are, these are the block of flats that are to the rear of the site, and the site drops down um, to those as well. So these are some images that are taken from the, neighbor, the neighbouring property um, at Sandalwood. So I've done the location plan at the top right corner so you can see the direction that the photo is taken. These are just useful for you to see for your own context. And as you can see at the bottom of these images is the block of flats as well. And these are some, these are some images that are taken from the neighbouring property plot one. Um, so this is located the one that fronts Bridge End Road. Again, the location plan shows you the direction that they're taking. Also shows that they are at a lower land level to the application site. This is the site plan that shows the replacement dwelling to the front of the site. The access road is down the western boundary and the two dwellings are located to the rear. It is noted that the... Um, oh, I'd also point out that to the rear of the site, there is the block of flats to the east of the site. Um, the, the, the application sites vary in plot width and depth, and to the west is the rear gardens of Bridge End Road. Given this, this context, it's the officer's view that the proposal would not form a poor relationship with the rhythm or the surrounding properties and would not appear as an isolated form of development. As also mentioned, the land level, le levels alter on the site, which further assists with this integration. The site plan sh can shows you that there's also the turning head is located here. The waste collection storage is here. The park, each property has two spaces. So the plot one to the front has two spaces to the front. This plot here has one space within the garage and one to the front. And then this property here has a tandem parking. The Surrey County parking standards set out that three bedroom dwellings require two off street parking spaces and therefore the proposal meets the parking standards. These are the elevations and floor plans for plot one. This image at the top shows the reduction in width of the existing dwelling to allow the, to allow the access road down the site. The dwellings will be this dwelling would be located in a similar position to the existing, but there would be addition of a single storey rear element. This is plot two, um, located to the rear of the site, and this one is the one that it has the internal garage. And then these are the floor plans and elevations for plot three. These cross sections are useful to understand the topographics of the site. The bottom cross section shows the relationship north to south and shows the plots to the rear are on a lower level. The top section shows the relationship between the neighbours to the west on Bridge End Road. The residential design guide sets out that back-to-back -back distances should be a minimum of 20 metres. This bottom cross-section shows that plot three here and its front elevation would be located approximately 32 metres from the rear elevation of the neighbour at Sandalwood to, to the north. So that's this distance here that you can see. As such, due to the land level changes in the distance as well, is in excess of the minimum distance set out in the residential design guide, the proposal would not result in unacceptable levels of overlooking. The plan also includes a 25 degree light angle, which can be used to assess if there's a material loss of daylight as set out within the residential guide guidance. So this is shown here against the block of flats to the rear of the site. During the course of the application, amended plans were received to reduce the number of units to the rear. This plan shows that the green is the original submission with the detached pair of semis. The pink shows the reduction to the, to, to the detached two-storey dwellings with attached garages and then the current proposal, which just has one of the dwellings with the attached garage. The officer's view is the reduction in level of built form has increased the spacing around the building to reflect the surrounding character. The plots located to the rear are located approximately 30 metres from the rear elevation of plot one and the, and the neighbour. Further, the proposed dwellings are located on a lower level, including this distances would be sufficient to prevent unacceptable levels of overlooking. Due to the distances from the neighbouring properties, it's the officers of the opinion that the proposal would not result in overbearing or loss of light to neighbouring properties. It is noted that there are first floor flank windows. However, a condition has been attached for this to be obscurely glazed to protect the privacy of this neighbour, and that's for plot one looking, in, uh, looking west. 
and there aren't any first floor windows in plot two looking towards the neighbours to the west. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have two public speakers. Um, firstly, Mr. Wright. Um, Mike, were you going across? Oh, there, but it's a different layout. It's done to confuse me. Um, Mr. Wright, you will have four minutes uh, and you will be given an indication when there is one minute remaining and the time will start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking a number of the planning committee for recently investing time to attend the site in June. Solstrand has not been habited for three years, and until recently it contained 20 trees. Today, six gardens back onto the rear garden of Solstrand. It's a back garden space and is far away from noise, cars and pollution, and offers a private space for the families of adjoining properties. The height drops significantly seven metres from top to bottom. Our ask is for you to reject this planning proposal as it currently stands for the following three reasons. Firstly, the impact of the neighbouring six properties and gardens. 100% of the neighbours who gardens border onto Solstrand have objected to the proposal, together with the residents of Lower Station Road. The proposed houses are overbearing and out of character with the back garden area, and result in a lack of privacy to the houses of the Alms, Sandalwood, Plot One, Casimir, Englewood and Windlecott. This includes direct line of sight into the garden, living room, dining room, bedrooms and the ground and first floor. No details of screening or landscaping has been provided. The residents will be impacted by the traffic noise and pollution due to the two additional houses, vehicles, turning circle and 20 metres of extra road. The overbearing nature of plot two will impact the light and will cast a shadow on the vegetable gardens of the Alms and Sandalwood. Secondly, overdevelopment of a constrained space. Due to a lack of space, the developer has had to rely on one of the spaces for parking being in a garage. That's just not representative of current living. To include an area to turn, the visitor car, visitor car parking spaces have been removed. People will be forced to park in the turning circles as the nearest public parking is at Bagshot train station due to station road being yellow lined for safety reasons. The plans for fire and emergency access is on the absolute edge of being acceptable under building regulations. This goes to the heart of there being a space that is really um, space constrained and overdeveloped site. At the last planning committee meeting in June for Brackendale, this committee, this committee set a precedent and I quote, the level of car parking proposed in respect to the potential number of occupants along with the visitor and disabled parking was insufficient for the location and environment and causes a cumulative impact. This precedent should also apply to Solstrand. Thirdly, flooding. Additional water runoff will result in the flooding to Hartdean Court, which houses 85 people in wardened accommodation. It's not just flats. They, are also, they also require ambulance access to the same point. Immediately behind Windlecott, the council has acknowledged the existence of a road safety issue by erecting a sign to warn motorists of the constant flow of water and ice. There will be smells due to the access point, sewage holding tanks and double stage pumping of water and fowl. This will impact in the summer when residents want to enjoy the rear gardens and will direct, be directly along the boundary line of Sandalwood. The current main sewer already gets blocked by sewage from just two houses. In conclusion, we request the support of our elected representatives to ensure that suitable development is made on the Solstrand site, which reflects and answers the needs of local residents. The proposal is too far weighted to the developer's interests. The material planning considerations are Concern relating to highway safety to motorists and pedestrians, flood risk to neighbouring properties and ice build-up on Bridge Road. Privacy, as there's no direct line of sight into neighbours' living, uh, living and bedroom areas. Loss of light and sunshine into back garden allotment areas and the request for a condition to be attached to the rear of Plot 1 has been refused. Parking provision and safety, impact on character and trees, insufficient parking provision, impact of noise, fumes and smells, scale, dominance and overdevelopment as outlined in the Surrey Heath Residential Design Guide. This is not just about one or two items. There are many cumulative material planning issues which it fails on. Whilst we cannot support the current proposal in any way, we do support the redevelopment of the existing property of Solstrand. Uh, Mr. Wright, can I ask feel... uh, you to um, 
come to a close. Finish your just that section. Sure. Don't come to a close. Uh, we you. we do support the redevelopment of the main of the main location, but not the the additional houses at the, to the rear. And for that reason, we ask you to reject the current proposal. Thank you very much. Um, can you say the second, please? Members, do you have any questions of a planning nature for the speaker? Councillor White. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question for the speaker or for the planning officer, but I'll ask it and I'll be I'll guide told. you. I know you will. Um, the flooding that we refer to and the trouble that is happening on um, Bridge Road is constant in the winter. It's constant icing across. We always thought that that was a problem with one of the houses in Bridge Road, um, flooding or something going wrong. Um, are you aware of the farm that used to be at the top of the road and the well and the spring, natural spring that's there? Is, has it been confirmed that that is You're one beginning of the... to creep away. Just keep to the point and well, bring is... subject, please. Say again? Can you just bring your question? Can you get your so question, the quest please? The question is, um, is, are you aware or do you know or does anybody know whether this spring and this well is the cause of the flooding and it won't go away if we build more houses there? That makes sense. Um, actually, Mr Purden is watching in and that may be a better question for Mr Purden. As you've asked it, I'll ask Mr Purden to come in because it's slightly unfair to Mr Wright because you're asking him a technical question. So if I ask Mr Purden, if you don't mind, Mr Wright, I'll let, I can come back to you. Don't go away. Mr Purden, can you comment on... Yeah, sorry, question, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, right, obviously, uh, the development will have an effect to sort of neighbours. Uh, the problem is... Technically, there are solutions. Um, there are preferred solutions, which the applicant still has to explore and prove that they are either not viable or not um, in some way going to work. I, you know, it's hard to... The problem is with this one, it's, there's several sort of constraints. There is nearby floodplain, which is the Hartdean, Hartdean Court. Um, there is associated flood defence measures already within the pipes or the systems, the sewers, the highway drains and whatever else because of the floodplain. So all of these things need to be sort of checked and calculated and make sure that everything will function as one. But obviously, yeah, the idea overall is to minimise any sort of effect to neighbours and to mitigate any flooding as much as possible. The problem is, is the best solution at the moment appears to be to involve some of the neighbours in the solution, um, basically for a gravity outfall at some point to take excess flow. Um, the rest of the work, obviously, the highway flooding may be an associated issue. I can check with highways to find out what they believe that problem to be. Obviously, if they put a sign up, it seems strange. It's a long term issue. So I'll have to you know, check with them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wright, have you got any comments, further questions on that question? It, it's a well-known um, water problem from the other side of Station Road. A number of houses have been affected on that side. Clearly, the, the ice point and where the sign is, uh, there is water that flows across the road in sort of, you know, the tail end of the year and the beginning of the year. And the danger there, obviously, is continuous water flows and ice does form over that point. Our expectation, clearly, I can't prove that is that uh, this would actually make that issue particularly worse. As the neighbours, we are in objecting to the actual proposal as it stands and haven't been approached regarding supporting any form of extra, um, extra drainage or runoff or anything along those lines. I don't think we would be supportive. Thank you. Councillor Gordon, and they'll come back. <clears throat> so I have a question, first of all, for Mr Wright. So from first-hand experience, I've seen cars park on WL lines on Station Road numerous times and it's caused a real issue so far with the uh, replacement buses trying to get down there and the big vehicles, ambulances and fire engines. Um, do you feel there will be more cars parked on the double yellows as a result of this? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly during the construction phase, absolutely. Plus, of course, there'll be additional houses which will be there too. 
I think the issue relating to um, buses and weekends, we know that Station Road is frequently, um, or the station is frequently suspended with trains running, so there are a lot more additional um, larger vehicles that go up and down the road as well during the weekend. Thank you. I, second question for the committee, possible. <clears throat> so on the um, Bagshot local plan, or the Surrey Hayes local plan, on the houses for Bagshot, these weren't identified as houses. So do we have to... Is this a question for the Speaker or the officers? Uh, officers, right, we'll come, come back to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Morley. Thank you. Um, you raised an issue about um, access for fire engines. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, the space down, there's an additional road that's being installed down the length of the, um, the Solstrand property. And there are some specific width requirements relating to emergency vehicles to go down there, as well as to um, refuse collections, etc. That is on the edge of being acceptable in terms of building regulation, uh, which was the point I was pulling out. Apologies, I had to check something. Would you mind repeating that answer, please? Thank you. So, Mr. Wright, I, can you give, give that answer again, please? Apologies. Yeah, the question was in relationship, uh, relation to the, um, the, the access for emergency vehicles. The point I made was that the site is quite a constrained site, and, and due to that, the absolute minimum requirement has been, has been met um, because there just wasn't any more room to provide for emergency access, but that has been met as part of the application. Thank you very much. Councillor White. Talking of fire engines, I believe there was a fire at the property. Um, did the fire en was the fire engine be able to um, access that? The, the myth of the fire, um, actually Solstrand is not fire damaged. Um, at the bottom of um, Solstrand, um, the original developer, when they chopped down the 20 trees, put them all in a big pile and decided to burn them. Um, and that actually caught light and wouldn't go out. So the fire, the fire um, uh, services were called out to actually put that out. Um, at that point in time, they uh, actually it took them many, many weeks to put it out because it kept on relighting. Um, but eventually that was put out and that was at the bottom of the garden. Yes, Councillor White. Somewhere in the papers it says that the house was um, subject to fire damage and that's why it was agreed that it could be demolished and rebuilt. So there was no fire at the house whatsoever. It was just down the bottom where the trees were. It was at the bottom okay. of the garden. Thank you. Um, any other Questions for the speaker? No. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Wright. And um, we now have um, Mr. Cobbold. And again, uh, four minutes with an indication of a minute left. And if you would say that after your presentation, please. And the time will start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll try and address some of the issues we've just heard. Um, I think the committee is being distracted a little bit here by non-technical or non-planning issues um, as a bit of a, a way of, of distracting from the, the simple planning argument we've got in front of us. Um, we've heard that the local residents, they don't want backland development. That's, that's their starting point, and it seems that they'll throw any argument at it to stop that backland development. The question is, what is the harm? What is the harm arising from the development um, we've heard of lack of space. Well, I can tell you, and I will tell you in a minute, about how we've squeezed from five houses on the site to three. Um, we've heard about car parking, lack of car parking. Well, there is uh, standards, and we satisfy them. Um, double yellow lines, why, why aren't you enforcing them? That's got nothing to do with planning if people are going to park on Station Road, but it's, it is irrelevant. We've got the parking standards satisfied. Um, so let's take you back a stage. Let's go back to when we first engaged with the council. I'm talking May 2021, when we put in a pre-app in for five houses. We got a response to that in August 2021, so a year ago, confirming that the council would support development at the back of the site. 
Um, but they said there were concerns about the amount of dwellings we were proposing. So we reduced that from four to three at the back of the site in a full application submitted on the 27th of October last year. Site visit with the case officer in December of the same year. And it was confirmed that the quantum of development was, was good. Was ha they were happy with it. And we were going to committee in January or February at the latest. Uh, a few technical responses bounced around, which we responded to, highways, drainage, things like that. Um, and then suddenly things changed. Suddenly we had managers on the, on the scene. We had people telling us that we were over, um, over developing the site and we had to reduce the scheme further. So we did. We did. We took um, the officers out on site. We showed them how it, how it sloped away. And that's an important part of your consideration. And I'm grateful to the committee who went to see that um, because I think it, it makes a big difference here. Um, so we got on the agenda for the committee in June, and then on the morning I was told that we had a drainage objection. Goodness knows where that came from, but I think it might have been triggered by some of the people we've just heard talking. Um, drainage officer had concerns, apparently, um, which we then had to go away and address. So we did. We did. We went away, addressed it, and we have no objection from your drainage officer, which I think is important to note. And... Um, I know he's on the on the screen. We can't see him, but he is he is there. It is a no objection, despite answering questions a moment ago, suggesting uh, he was maybe wavering. I don't I don't know. But anyway, it's no objection. So I know preaps are um, only an officer opinion, but they are your trained officers. They are here to guide you. They are here to to work with applicants like like myself, like my clients. And we did that, and we've got an application here in front of you, which. Which is acceptable, thank you. Um, we've worked very hard to get here. We've addressed all the issues. We've addressed the technical issues. Um, you've approved two houses which have been built next to Queen Anne House. And um, to say that um, there is going to be construction vehicles on the highway is a bit of a, um, a rich thing to throw at us, given our clients allowed all of those vehicles to park on his site whilst, whilst they've been building. They've been building two houses on a site about half the size of, of this one um, in the setting of a listed building. Um, so I think this is a good site. This is a perfect site for development, to be, to be honest. It's taken a long time to get here, and I don't think any refusal would be a planning judgment. Um, I think it would just be trying to, trying to prevent development. Um, it's time that we got this sorted. It's time that this existing house, which is an eyesore, is replaced, and I think it's in everyone's interest. And I'm glad that councillors came in with an open mind, um, hopefully, to, to understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, members, questions for Councillor White? I take offence that you say we are distracting. We are local councillors, we live in the village, we know the ups and downs and the problems that residents have. This is a quality of life situation for residents and that you are going to affect this with this. And I, don't, I know it's not a planning thing, but I think your attitude could be a little less patronising towards the residents whose lives are going to be changed with this. Did you listen to anything that was said by the previous speaker? And are you going to be able to attempt to help with any of the issues, i.e. parking? You say there's relevant parking there. There's not enough parking. There's going to be a three-bedroomed house. Most three-bedroomed houses have two cars, if not three cars, with kids growing up. And there is no extra parking. There is no visitor parking. And you're saying that this is acceptable. I refer to the open mind again. Um, sorry if I came across patronising. That wasn't a plan. But I have an opinion to offer. And I will offer it as robustly as I need to. Um, you heard from Melissa. She gave a presentation and she said it satisfies the parking standards. Three bedroom houses need two parking spaces. I, I don't make the rules up. I don't make the policy up. I advise my client on how to apply policy. Those parking standards are there for a reason. They are from Surrey County Council, and they show and say that you need two parking spaces. What, if, I, if I tell my client to provide more parking spaces, then, okay, maybe not in this case, but I do genuinely run the risk of getting a refusal on over-provision of parking because, it, because it's encouraging the use of the motor car. And that's, that's the reason for the standards to make sure you get the balance between understanding people have cars, we get that, but also discouraging the use of the car, discouraging people from day-to-day -day cars, and that's what reduction in parking does to some extent achieve. And that is the policy. 
Thank you. Councillor Morley. Thank you. Um, please, could you confirm the width um, of that um, driveway so that we can judge whether um, emergency vehicles can get down there? And also, what's the width of the garage door? And what size car can go in the garage? And can you confirm that once the car is in the garage, it's possible to open the doors to get in and out, having um, actually gone to a new house and made the comment when I was viewing it, with a view to purchase it, that um, I said, oh, it looks a bit narrow to get a car in. And I was told by the salesperson, oh, but you don't put cars in garages these days. Well, I'm sorry, I put my car in a garage. And what's more, I expect to be able to get out of it once I've got in. And this committee has never refused in a planning application on the grounds of too much parking, if only we had that option. I'm glad to hear it. Um, but uh, I, I don't have the plans to hand, but I, I know as a fact from talking to the highway engineer that it's over, uh, well, it's certainly four metres wide, the driveway going down, the, down to the back, um, which is, we've even heard from the local resident, it is the width you need to take a large vehicle down a fire, fire tender we heard about. Let's go with, let's go with that as our, as our example. Um, the fire tender can get down. It's wide enough. Even the local residents confirmed that. Um, in terms of the garage, it's three by six, which is the three by six metres, I should say, which is the required width. I don't know how wide the door is, um, but your officers will have plans in front of them, and I'm sure they can confirm that for you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Ms Tony, do you want to make any further comment on, on what's been said? I might be able to answer a few of the questions that were just asked there. So, yeah, I can confirm that the, the actual garage has an internal space of 3.3 by 6 metres standard for a parking space would be 2.4 by 4.8 so I'd say that's that garage is big enough to get to get in and out of your car there's enough width either side um, and then was it just on the width of the access road is that the other was that the other question how width the access road was um, so it's like it slightly ranges but it's about 4.3 meters wide the access road and is that wide enough for the latest vehicles that have been purchased by Surrey County Council as fire vehicles yeah, so highways have confirmed that the, the, that the fire... I have got the... Um, yeah, so hi, the highways have confirmed that the fire engine actually would only need to... It would reverse down there and it would only need to come down about 20 metres and it would be within the vicinity of the hydrant then. Um, so it is wide enough for the fire vehicle to access the site. Um, it wouldn't come down and turn... Um, because it doesn't need to. I'm sure the residents will find that very reassuring. Uh, Councillor Betton. Thank you, Chairman. The, um, the, the turning area in front of the two houses, could you tell me the dimensions of that, please? I don't actually think I've got, I've got those to hand. I can see if I've got them, but I don't think I've got a copy of them here. Um, I have seen the tracking diagram and it is wide enough um, for the vehicles to come down and do the three-point turn and come back out in the forward gear, though. Councillor Noble. Thank you. Um, could you advise, please, if the fire engine has to reverse 20 metres, what are the plans for escape from a fire, held at, uh, a fire at the rear two properties, please? Uh, sorry, Councillor Noble, can you just repeat that question again, please? If the fire engine can only reverse 20 metres down the, down the side road, yeah. how, how would exit be obtained from a house at the rear of the property if there is a fire? The engine can't get there with an extending ladder, for example. But the width is wide enough for pedestrians to actually get past, so I wouldn't... Sorry, the, the officer said that the engine could not go all the way down, the book to have to reverse in. Can we have clarification on that point, please? So, on that point, though, I mean, it, I mean, it is quite common for um, backland sites to have fire hydrants, so the vehicle will go in 
like polyinthocytes, and then it would, then it would connect into a fire hydrant, and that would be used to basically put out any fire to um, the rear, rear of the property. So I'm not understanding the issue in terms of... Uh, okay, the, so the if a person is trapped in an upstairs bedroom yeah. and needs to be removed from the property, we can't wait for a fire to be put out. You've got to remove the person. How do you get access to remove that person if the hydrant can't, can't if the engine cannot get up with an extending turn, uh, ladder, for example? So that would be basically, in term, I mean, I don't know how the fire brigade operate, but they would have to have it, they would take a ladder down to the site to, to rescue the, the actual person. So that's how it would operate. Can I ask, do, do all fire hydrants that, or fire engines, fire appliances that leave, um, that work, operate in the area, have that equipment on board? Which equipment are you talking about, about ladders here? The ladders that would reach the, the properties to, to rescue somebody, say, from the roof space or, or from a first floor, from an upper story. <coughs> Sorry, I've had a house fire. I know, I know how dangerous it is, and I am really concerned that um, somebody might lose their life if the property is not adequately serviceable from, by the fire service. Um, I mean, in terms of the fire service and the equipment, I, I mean, um, I don't have the knowledge to actually give you that assurance in terms of that level of information. Um, we would probably have to go away and, and, and speak to the fire brigade about that, but I can't give you the assurance what they uh, actually carry on their um, vehicle, but um, they would most likely have a ladder on the vehicle, but I can't give you that assurance. In this meeting. That, yeah, but, but, but in terms of um, this application, um, I think we're getting into remits. I know fire is a very serious matter, but in terms of the planning consideration of, of the application, that wouldn't be a, a, a planning issue as such. Um, as, as the officer said, uh, the vehicle can partly get into the site. There'll be a fire hydrant, um, which will be used for the rear of the site. But in terms of the other technical matters about do we have ladders or hoses and things, I can't give you that answer. But that's not really a planning matter, really. Can I just come in here um, slightly, but bring it back a little bit. The major issue, to my mind, on here seem, would be the drainage, the dealing of the foul and storm drainage, and how that is dealt with. Um, and Mr. Purden commented earlier on, um, on saying that the drainage issues weren't completely resolved. Um, can somebody expand on that, please? So they, the applicants have submitted additional information which has been reviewed by our drainage engineer and it's considered that the sufficient information has been submitted to us that we're satisfied that we can attach a condition that the further details that are required can be secured by a condition. We also, um, which is out noted on the update, that the Lead Local Flood Authority also support a condition on this site as well. And the... Um let me get this in my mind. The house is down the bottom and the foul and drainage is pumped to a chamber, a reflection chamber, which Mr. Wright commented on. Um, the responsibility for the maintenance of that chamber and the system will lie with whom? Um, one of the documents outlines that it will be a management company that will be um, looking after that once the development is completed. Um, Chair, um, if you look at uh, page, uh, sorry. Uh, if you go to page 32, um, at the top of page 32, C talks about providing details of who the management um, responsibilities will be and maintenance regimes and similarly in condition 19 it does the same thing so they will have to provide that as part of the planning condition um, so right okay I'll come back on to that in due course um, Mr Gordon you wanted to come in yeah I have a couple of questions and, and a couple of comments if possible 
Um, on page 59 of the document showing the, um, the view of the two, plot two and plot three, following the site visit there, um, you mentioned that there's one parking space in the garage and one in front of the, of the house there. So when we went down to the site visit and we saw the actual space in person, um, if there was a car in front of the garage, as it's meant to be, there didn't appear to be enough room for the turn circle to happen. The turn circle works fine if there's no cars parked there. That's my concern. It's in quite a tight area if there is parking as outlined on, on the document. Um, my second question is um, that area of Bagshot recently has had a lot of development. A lot of the residents have been impacted by Queen, Queen Anne's house quite badly and um, areas around that area of London Road. Um, if this house is were to, develop, were to be developed, um, they weren't identified as part of the local plan. So that's the question. So kind of why when they earmarked first of all, Bagshot seems to have enough houses and we've fulfilled the criteria um, for the area. And my kind of quite a probably important question really to the committee is Mr. Wright quoted um, that we'd set a precedent with Brackendale and the president that we'd, that we'd set ourselves as a committee seemed to apply to this application here. So I'd like the uh, members to be mindful that we kind of, um, we should be consistent in our approach on this application. Um, in relation then to the parking, I, I, th I think maybe this, if the site plan shows that the parking is like solely within their space. It isn't actually within the turning head. So the parking spaces don't fall within that turning head. The site plan, it's, they're quite dis they're slightly different colours that you can sort of see that it's more the darker grey and then the parking spaces you probably say are a slightly lighter brown, which I think would clearly distinguish between that. Um, and then I just maybe just say about the parking, obviously, um, I don't actually know what happened at the previous meeting about that, um, but I would point out to members that obviously that the MPPF paragraph 111 sets out the development should only be uh, refused on highway grounds if it would be unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residential cumulative impact on the uh, road network would be severe. So d the word severe here in this case, I draw your attention to that it would be in my opinion that the term severe is a high bar to me and therefore the net increase of two units without any visitor parking or meeting of parking requirements would not result in a severe impact to the highway network to warrant a refusal. So I'd just like members to bear that in mind. Yes, Mr. Councillor Black. Thank you, Chair. Um, the officer earlier made reference to some of the details of the drainage scheme potentially requiring, requiring the cooperation of the neighbours. Mr. Wright indicated he didn't believe any such cooperation would be forthcoming. Um, I'm not familiar with the nuances of the drainage schemes enough. Is that the same drainage scheme referred to in Condition 19, which, requ which would require the full details to be submitted to and approved in writing to the planning, by the Planning Authority before development commenced? Yes, yeah, so they've submitted an outline details to us. Um, so there's some drawings that show that but would require much further detailed technical information to be submitted. So it would be based on that information that's been submitted to us. It would just be a further level of detail. So if that was the case and this application was approved, it wouldn't be able to progress any further if the neighbour didn't support the details of that scheme? There'd become civil matters between the landowners if, if that was the case and that would fall outside of the planning remit. Can I just come back on one point which Councillor Gordon raised about um, the availability of the land? I think you raised about that. I mean, as part of the local plan, as you know, we've done quite extensive work in terms of looking for land for housing. Um, not all sites are captured um, through this um, assessment, um, but it shouldn't circumvent or shouldn't detract from not bringing this site forward as a residential site. Um, the policy team have done quite a lot of work on that, but not all sites have been captured. Um, they're mainly the, the, the larger sites in terms of those sites coming forward as part of that process. Councillor Lewis. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I'll be honest, like, the drainage situation bothers me as well, but I'm not an expert, sorry. But in part 18 on page 47, the reason is given to ensure the design meets the national non-statutory technical standards. If they're non-statutory, are they actually legally obligated to meet them? Uh, 
So, what, what, on page 47, what clause are you looking at? Um, sorry, it's the last paragraph of uh, part 18. 18. The reason. Right. Thank you. That's the standard term terminology, and even the lead local flood authority would use the same terminology. That is, that, that's the legislation that's relied upon in terms of assessing flood risk and, and drainage issues. Um, so that condition on page 47 for everybody is the same as what's reported earlier on in the, in the agenda. It's just been repeated at the end there. Uh, are there any other questions? Just Councillor White. Um, I'm still worried about the two houses down the bottom overlooking Sandalwood. If you remember rightly at the site visit, the um, owner's wife stood in the window and um, just stood there and waved and everybody down the bottom waved back at her so they could see her clearly and that was from the lower level. There's going to be houses there now with two levels and there's no um, provision for landscaping or screening or anything. Is there anything that can be done about that? Because it's, you know, it's total loss of privacy and overlooking. I would just draw your attention actually back to the residential design guide that does set out um, that a 20 metre distance will be required. And this is in well in excess of that. And I know you're saying obviously they're building up, but that reduction in height also helps that di increases that distance of that perception of overlooking um i'm not sure what could you know if you you would want to add any lands additional landscaping there there obviously is a landscaping condition that's been attached but you wouldn't normally expect to see sort of high hedging put up there there'll be the normal boundary fence and the fence the hedging that you'd expect but i would say that that distance is sufficient to mitigate on un any unacceptable levels of overlooking Okay, just looking around. Councillor Alloway. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was just looking at this one, and I just do not like the um, a bobsleigh run of that road going down the side there to access plots two and three. Less, the too narrow for um, vehicles that um, what a two meet in the middle. Well, <laughs> you'd be a person back onto the road. Plots two and three, the provision of parking just isn't realistic. And no one's going to put that car in the garage. They'll be parked in that turning head. And you get one utility vehicle in there, and it's full up. Even if they can actually turn around with two or three cars parked in that area. I was just looking at what this is termed as backland development, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I was just looking at um, other councils' approach to it, like Newport. Tandem development generally unacceptable because of the impacts of all the things that the residents have been raising. Um, however, I, I do accept if we had a 2.5 year housing supply, you would have to look really hard at how you can get this through, but we are not in that situation. Um, so I, I don't feel there's any need that we should um, impose difficult living conditions, especially for parking for future residents. If you want to offer a, me to offer a, a suggestion, then I would uh, make that access road much wider. I would half that garden on plot one, make that big turning circle and parking appropriate and realistic for the plots two and three, and make plots two and three single level, and there's no overlooking. Thank you. Councillor Whitcroft. Thank you. Could we add a condition, please, that prevents the garage from being converted into living space based on the parking policy requirements so that the garage is required as a parking space? The garage space should be maintained as an internal parking space in perpetuity and alternative use, including storage, should be conditioned in order to protect neighbours' amenity. I think that's the first. Um, anybody, anybody against that? No. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. I just made a note here: garage to remain as garage without going into the. Uh, 
because I couldn't write that fast. Can I just comment, sorry, Chairman, that you've already got condition 15, which talks about um, retention of parking and turning areas. So I would suggest you just add the garage within that as well, for the avoidance of doubt. Thank you for that. Uh, members, any other comments on that? Um, we have an officer recommendation and there are amendments on the, there's amended conditions on the update and there's that further amended condition uh, just now. Um, is there a proposer and a seconder for the officer recommendation? Councillor Betton, I will second. Um, all those in favour of the recommendation to grant as amended. I read them out for you. Uh, sorry, that is. All those against? Okay, members, can we have some reasons, some planning reasons for refusal, um, which we need to agree now. We'll stay until we're agreed. And we're not going home till they're done. So, can members, you wish to refuse that? Can we have some planning reasons, please? Parking is not an acceptable reason. Councillor Black. Let me try. Drainage scheme hasn't been agreed and doesn't look like it could be, it could be agreed. Uh, Councillor Black, like we do have the conditions attached prior to commencement development to provide further information on that. So that is being conditioned as part of the application. So as a reason for refusal. I don't think I would stand in terms of going to appeal. Next. Councillor Alloway. Why isn't the Brackendale option that we use to refuse that um, application on parking? Why can't we use that principle? I mean, in terms of parking, um, I mean, obviously, we've got uh, Surrey County Council's policies on parking. They provided the adequate parking for the number of houses being proposed. They provided a garage, which is a policy as well. Um, so they've got a policy compliance scheme. Uh, officers have, ha have actually said in terms of the turning circle, um, it works. Uh, also, you, you've got to think about when they had more units at the back of the site, it worked as well. You've got less units on the site now. Um, and, it, and the turning circle, the turning circle works. So refusing it on parking wouldn't obviously be uh, a dependable reason at appeal. Councillor Gordon. So the conditions um, suggested by um, Mr Wright residents for reasons for refusal, uh, just to rear them again, were concerns relating to highway safety to motorists and pedestrians, flood risks, neighbourhood properties and ice build-up on Bridge Road, privacy for the line of sight, even though you said 20 metres, um, those who went on the site visit still feel it's inadequate from seeing the neighbour in, the, um, in the area. Loss of light, sunshine, to back garden, a lot of areas, and request for conditions to prevent further development uh, into the rear part of plot one have been refused. Parking provision, impact on character and trees, insufficient parking, impact of noise, fumes and smells, scale, dominance, no development, as outlined in the Surrey Heath Residential Design Guide on the six adjoining gardens. For some reasons there we could have. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. Um, I think um, I would point members uh, to page 37 of the committee report, uh, where officers have actually outlined uh, the requirements in terms of the RDG and also the separation distance between neighbouring properties. As you can see, 
uh, the proposed development far exceeds uh, the RDG requirements to refuse that um, based on our own RDG guidelines would not be defendable at appeal as well. Um, also, sunlight and daylight has been assessed in terms of the application. Again, that's not going to be defensible as appeal also. Um, in terms of um, the other matters uh, which you raised in terms of highway safety and uh, parking on uh, station roads, um, again, hi highways, um, sorry, uh, as Surrey County Council has uh, provided robust comments on that. Um, I don't think you can say this development is going to worsen uh, the traffic impact on the site. They're providing adequate parking. Um, there's adequate access on the site as well. And also the issue with the flooding um, and the icing, that's a historic matter. And I don't think you can actually say this scheme is going to worsen that, uh, that element um, in, in, the, in, the, in the local area. We were actually shown a plan earlier on showing the angle of vision and the daylight as part of the officer presentation. <coughs> and um, uh, sorry, Councillor Wheeler, you, I'm sorry, but you cannot take part in the. Um, Councillor Morley. Can we add that it is out of character for this area because there are no other back garden developments around there that I can see. Um, so I think that this uh, development is completely out of character for the area. And I suspect that quite a lot of the residents who would be the experts on the character of the area would agree. And can you expand on why, why it's out of character? Just because it's at the back, obviously you have to look at the context as to how it relates to neighbouring units and, and how it sits within that context. So just to say it's at, at the back of other properties, you need to differentiate or explain that harm in greater detail. In particular, the number plot one, no other house around there has is a... In what I would classify as an inferior type of house in that you actually have the front of somebody's house looking onto your back garden. So that is putting that house at what I would say is a disadvantage and reduced, reducing the character. The two houses at the back, they have the disadvantage of having to go up quite a steep, narrow road to get in and out. Um, and they have an issue with their um, waste as well, which again is something that other houses around there do not. All other houses that I can see on the map have um, frontage to the road, and I would say that that was the character for the houses around there. Um, Councillor Morley, I think um, in terms of um, some of your comments you've, you've actually raised there, um, in terms of refuse, there's a collection point uh, where residents would take their refuse to a collection point and it's been assessed by our waste team and that's considered to be acceptable. In terms of the... It, it I'm not talking about waste, I'm talking about other houses have the frontage and can I refer you mainly, may, maybe to the 3032 Kingsley application and the out of character comments on that. I know it was a few years ago but I'm sure that the chairman will help you find it, if not I will let you know. Can I just come back on to the character point because obviously uh, officers strongly basically um, gave you an overview about the local area. Uh, you've got Queen Anne House, which is basically a flat development of houses. You've got towards the rear of the site, you've got a flat development as well. So you've got a different whole character. So in terms of having two houses in the back of the garden, I don't think that's going to really affect the character as much because there's such a varied character of, of buildings in the, in the local area. <coughs> So I think that needs to be taken in the round when you consider about refusing something on character on two houses in the rear garden. Kingsley Avenue with Surrey Wooded Hills as well. It has a different character criteria. Yeah. And it's hedge. Right. Um, I'd written down, try and maybe help. I'm not sure if it is going to help because we've covered this. Um, I'd written down as the drainage not being resolved. That has been dealt with. That's been dealt with by condition, um, and it's. I've written down creation of gravity outfall. 
the water flow and the storage of sewerage. I mean, all of that has been covered by condition. So, uh, members, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, so far we have no reasons for refusal which are dependable in the eyes of the uh, chair of the officers. Council White. Would um, inefficient access for emergency vehicles come into it or not? Because um, we've got grave concerns about that, that the emergency vehicles would not be able to get down to the bottom two houses. And having to back in would take even more time. Uh, Councillor White, it's the same issue again in terms of highways have looked at the scheme and they haven't raised any concerns in terms of the turning on the, on the site, in terms of the emergency vehicles access, etc. So no, that wouldn't be defensible. Councillor Lewis. Thank you. I, as I said before, it's, it's the drainage thing that bothers me. You know, and we represent the people of the borough and they all said that they are worried about flooding. And what we've got in front of us, I don't, you know, it just says, oh, we'll deal with that at some point in the future. And I, I just don't think I can vote on it. I, I need a bit more that shows work's been done on it. Councillor Lewis, I mean, um, as, as outlined in the report and by officers tonight, there are conditions being implemented and there's going to be further information submitted. And um, as, as, as Ms Turney has said, um, uh, the local lead, lead, lead authority for Surrey County Council has assessed the scheme and considered the application to be acceptable, subject to conditions being imposed as part of the application. So there's, there's going to be further information submitted um, to, to actually overcome your concerns in terms of flooding. Uh, Councillor Whitcroft, sorry about that. Thank you. Surely, can this not be considered as um, overbearing to affect other residential amenity? I think we'll come back to Ms Turney's report and uh, presentation on the angles and the daylight and the uh, we didn't get a sunshine graph, or whatever it's called. You know what I mean? But we... Uh, it was quite clearly shown that in terms of the positioning of the properties, there was a adequate, in terms of design guide, distance between the adjoining properties, correct? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I, we're going to be here for a while because we're struggling on this one. Um, and I, I'm going to make a suggestion, um, which I hope will meet with approval, that, I mean, clearly the drainage is an issue. Um, the other items I get where people are concerned about, but we can't alter the car parking. We can't alter the advice from the county. We're not going to an appeal on the car parking and on the uh, access to the fire engine. I have my own reservations concerned about if I was in the building, I'd be slightly worried about a fire engine reversing down a road. But um, that has been given the big tick by highways. And I do wonder whether we should... The drainage is the one issue that is causing us all problems. Um, we're not experts. Um, we've heard from Mr. Purden. I'm not 100% convinced or fully understood what he was saying in all honesty. And I do suggest maybe that we defer this on the drainage item. And I stress the drainage item only uh, to bring this back at a further date. Is that going to be acceptable? Yes, that would be acceptable. Members, is that acceptable to you? Right. Can I therefore make a revised proposal 
um, and I think I have a seconder, that this item is deferred and brought back to this committee to discuss the drainage element only. Agreed? Are you all, is that in agreement? Councillor Alloway is seconding that, yes? Yeah. Anybody against? Right, members, that, thank you for your support there. That is agreed that this item is deferred for a further meeting to discuss the drainage implications um, and we will get more technical information which hopefully we can all understand. Thank you, members. Thank you, members of the public, for that item. Um, and we will then move on. I'm having a slight change of um, order. Uh, if you Cameron, don't just mind. On a point before we move on a point of order, just before we move. Sorry, Councillor Rice. Thank you. I would just like to raise the point. Obviously, there were three latecomers to the. Um, and I would just request that calendar appointments are updated because the calendar appointment for this committee meeting uh, says 7 p.m. And I appreciate it was a mistake. I'm not casting um, blame. We can't actually update Eddie's appointments. Could so an we'll email then be them. sent yes. to yeah, members? Because obviously, as a... An email was sent out. Was no, it? sorry. Can I I made it is also on the yes, front page of the agenda. Uh, I am a substitute member, and when my substitution was then submitted, I should have been informed yeah. of the change of time. Thank You're you. absolutely right. Yeah, I did not... <laughs> Listen, I've read the agenda and I didn't pick it up, but thank you, Councillor White, for saying, oh, the meeting starts. And I didn't even know. I'm sorry. But, uh... My apologies. Yes, Councillor Wheeler. Um, I don't believe it's beyond the wit of man to send out an alternative um, invitation. And had there been two invitations, one starting at 6.30 and one starting at 7 o'clock, um, then those of us that hadn't noticed that it started half an hour earlier would have noticed and would have been here. Um, an email isn't really sufficient, I'm afraid. The appointment should have been changed or updated. And can we urgently look at all future appointments to make sure um, that this doesn't happen again? I totally agree. Um, Ms Simpson is standing in. She's helping us out. Um, the wheels came off on a couple of things today. That is one of them. Um, and yes, that has been taken on board. Yeah. Right. Um, we've now resolved that we will move to item, I find it, uh, it will be item number six, of item six on page 177, uh, we're slightly out of order here, um, 99 to 109 Guildford Road, Lightwater, um, uh, this is one, can you have um, some declarations on this, are there any declarations to make? No, this is an item that uh, we, uh, it has gone to appeal and we need to determine um, in advance um, that it would have been refused. Um, and Mr. Carty, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Duncan. Yes, sorry. <coughs> Page. Page 177 99 109 Guildford Road. Have you got it there? <coughs> It'll be item 7 on you. Huh? Is it 9? I've got it as item 6 because that's my order. You got it? Councillor Noble? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carty. Thank you. Uh, this relates to a non determination appeal under the written representation procedure. The proposal relates to a residential redevelopment of a commercial site in Lightwater. Please note there is no update, and I'll lead you through the drawings and photos. I'll stop for a second. Is it okay to continue? Yeah. <coughs> um, the site location, this is the site location plan for this proposal, and it's also shown with the existing layout. The application site lies on the southwest side of Guildford Road within the settlement of Lightwater. The site is currently vacant and includes a former car business, including sales and repairs. Offices at 111 Guildford Road lie to the west, with the Crossley Club beyond. Residential properties fronting Guildford Road and Queen Close behind lie to the southeast flank. Uh, properties in Oldsworth Close, uh, sorry, Oldsworth Close and Grasmere Road lie to the rear. Residential properties along uh, with Passfield 
lodge at the post office lie opposite the site. Now, this photo of the application site from Guildford Road shows the commercial nature of the site. There's the wider street seat view. Uh, the application site is on the right hand side and uh, past me a lodge and the post office is visible on the left. Uh, this is the proposed layout it providing 18 houses and 12 flats. It includes two terraces of houses at the front of the, of the site with a block of flats and uh, access road in between. The second road development including a terrace facing uh, the back of uh, the frontage properties and a second row at right angles and facing this rear terrace. Parking is provided principally along the access road uh, behind the frontage development. 34 parking spaces are provided to serve this development. Uh, these are the existing and proposed street seats to show the development against the existing buildings as viewed from Guildford Road. The residential properties fronting Guildford Road are on the left and 111 Guildford Road is on the right. Uh, these are typical elevations for the houses, including some two-storey houses and some with further accommodation in the roof. And uh, this is the front elevation of the flatter block facing Guildford Road. The principle for the development is considered to be acceptable removing a vacant, non-conforming commercial use from a predominantly residential area. However, the overall scheme is considered to be unacceptable and an objection is raised on five grounds. The layout and density of the developments and design, particularly of the flatted block, <coughs> and the dominance of hard standing in the centre of the site are considered to be unacceptable. It is considered to be an overdevelopment of the site harmful to local character. The amount of amenity space for the flats would also be insufficient, which would provide poor living accommodations, sorry, poor, poor living conditions for future residents. For clarity, the second sentence in paragraph 7.4.3 sets out the amenity requirements in the residential design guide and then the issues relating to this amenity provision for the flats is explained after in that paragraph. It's not been demonstrated that sufficient information has been provided to safeguard the health of neighbouring trees and a legal agreement has not been provided to secure contributions towards SAM and to secure affordable housing on the site. Whilst not secured, the affordable housing offered related uh, solely to providing intermediate housing, which diverts from the requirements of the first homes procedure notes, as explained in section 7.9 of the officer report. It's recommended that an objection is raised on the grounds as set out on pages 188 to 189 of the agenda report, and that the proposal would have been refused if this council were the determining authority. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carty. Um, as Mr. Carty says, that uh, this would have been refused, so we need to make a, uh, a resolution on this as part of the appeal process. Um, so, members, do you have any comments on this item? <coughs> if not, can I have a proposal and a seconder for Councillor White, Councillor Betton, all those in agreement? Thank you, members. That is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Carty. Thank you. I'll get going. Oh. <laughs> um, right, members, we go back to the um, main part, the, the original order, uh, which I have as item six on page 65, um, which is the first of two items on uh, Princess Royal Barracks in Deep Cut. And... Are there any declarations to make? Um, I'll start off by, I think I've, and I'm sure everybody's had a letter from uh, Skanska. Um, we all had that. Are there any other declarations to make? No. Uh, Mrs. Bishop. Thank you, Chair. This is the first of two applications this evening on the Princess Royal Barracks redevelopment in Deepcut. I thought it would be useful just to give a brief recap um, to understand where we are. 
This is the phasing plan for the redevelopment of Deep Cut. The issues we're looking at this evening, we have two infrastructure proposals before us tonight. The first one relates to the loop road here, and this is going to be the first application we'll be looking at. And the second one re relates to the Blackdown Road playing field, recreation ground, and what will be the Blackdown Angst. As you'll see from this um, phasing plan, all of the area coloured here in gold um, are going to be residential parcels. Uh, just to re looking over here, the area in blue is also going to be a residential uh, redevelopment. You've got the conversion of the sergeant's mess, which already has full permission by virtue of the original hybrid permission. And then you have phase 4H, which is around here, which we also call parcel X. That's going to be new build, but that will come forward in due course. Um, the proposals, as I say, are for infrastructure. So the, the one we are looking at first is for the loop road. Now, I apologise because of the, the scale of plans. We don't, they're not exactly perfect, but this is the, the loop road that is being proposed. Um, it is to provide um, access to... Uh, five residential parcels, which will provide 581 dwellings. Now, this is the view from uh, the two public areas. So this is from Mindenhurst Road. So we've got the school already there. Um, I, when I pass this this morning, I see that they've actually started demolishing these buildings here as part of um, the implementation of the next phase of works. Uh, this is looking down to, from Royal Way uh, down to Mindenhurst Road. So it's basically, we are standing there, that point is back there. This is Royal Way and this building has now gone. And this is down the other end at uh, opposite Forest Drive. Uh, the Trifselhoos houses are basically finished, which is phase 4A. Um, and this is bang opposite um, the Forest Drive access onto Mindenhurst Road. So this is where the southern part of the loop road will come out. And you will just see, looking towards it, it's coming down here. And this point here is down here. You can just see St. Barbara's Church over there. And you can see the school as well. So it, to give it some context, so we're coming up here, uh, by the, up by the school over here. We're coming through here. These buildings are already being demolished. Coming round here, down, and then we're coming back out to be opposite Forest Drive, which is just down here. Um, as you will see from the um, update sheet, um, there has been a lot of updates on this one, um, primarily related to landscape and trees. Um, we could not agree some of the details, so we have either reimposed conditions or changed them to make sure that we get all the right information uh, to ensure that we have an appropriate landscape solution, we are able to retain the trees, and that we can satisfactorily deal with site levels to make sure that where trees are shown to be retained, they are not compromised by any of the site levels. Uh, these are, this is the landscape general arrangement plan. Uh, the MPPF requires additional tree planting which we have secured through this. Um, however, there is an oak up here, and the, the tree planting around there is proposed as four field maples, which our tree officer says is not the right solution. Um, so you'll see from the update sheet that we have asked for uh, um, a variety in this location. Um, they are showing no landscaping around the drainage swale. Um, the reason that they said was because our drainage officer said you couldn't. Uh, well, we asked him, and he said you could. So we've added that as a condition as well to make sure, again, that we are reinforcing the rural landscape village character of Mindenhurst. So we are very keen to make sure that in accordance with the deep cut vision, we are keeping the green rural character. Right, that is that one. So the recommendation is to grant, subject to all the amendments on the amendment sheet. Uh, I don't know why that's done that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Um, before I go there, Councillor Deitch, you've indicated you wish to speak for the record as ward member. 
and substitute member of this committee, you are able to address the committee, although in this instance uh, you will not have a vote in the final outcome. Thank you, Councillor Deitch. Thank you, and uh, understood. Um, members, uh, it goes against everything I believe in, actually, to talk in favour of uh, the DIO. I think everybody here knows my thoughts on the DIO and um, uh, what a shower they are. But in this particular instance, um, I think the DIO and their developer, Skanska, and all the consultants have actually done a very good job uh, of, the, of, of what's, what's been proposed here. Um, I just want to thank Sarita Bishop um, and um, at Highways Planners at Surrey County Council who have been over this with a fine tooth comb. And I think that if you look at the reports, you'll see how much work has actually gone into this uh, proposal. I'm sure you've all read it word for word. Um, and I have to say, I'm particularly impressed with um, the options being uh, made available for sustain sustainable transport. I think that this uh, development is um, about as future-proof as anything that we've seen before, I think, um, in terms of sustainable tra uh, transport. Um, and also, I'd like to thank the developer for the flexibility they've offered, because I think that some of the things that have been asked for weren't originally um, in the outline um, uh, agreements. So, uh, I'd, uh, we've seen before, uh, because of delays, issues with viability, so I don't want, I, I, really what I'm asking you for it is uh, to, to grant, I know that's the officer recommendation, and I hope you will go with that and not cause any more unnecessary delays so that we can get this through. Uh, things are moving at a pace now at the development, um, and we want to see that continue. So uh, my uh, plea to you this evening is to, by all means, debate it robustly and all the rest of it, which I'm sure you'll do. But I think we need to get to um, getting this through this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Deitch. Members? Councillor Morley. Thank you. Um, this is really a plea, and I can't tell whether it's needed or not until I actually drive the road for the first time. But please, could it drive a little bit smoother than that interesting roundabout that has been put in? Um, which I have to say, when my daughter learned to drive, she said, hmm, this is interesting, isn't it, Mummy? And it is. It just doesn't follow the natural flow. And I think that this... I hope this new road will. I'm sure that loads of people who know about these things have looked at it. But I think that improves to date sustainability because you don't want cars braking when they don't need to. It should be nice and smooth and follow the natural flow of the road. And that will also help buses and people like that. Um, but I have to say, that roundabout doesn't quite work. So let's hope this road does. Councillor Rise, are you going to redesign the roundabout for us? Oh, I'm, I'm actually going to stand up for the roundabout. Um, <laughs> it's actually um, the roundabout, and I completely understand Councillor Morley's comments, because as is, it is very counterintuitive to, to have a very oddly designed roundabout to go down Deep Cuppage Road. But obviously, with the environmental improvement works that are due to come forward, the intention is for the new way through Deep Cut is to be taking the new Spine Road down past the school. So Deep Cut Bridge Road is to no longer be the primary route through Deep Cut, which is the design of that roundabout. As you come on, is to then take you straight off into the other way. Obviously, that roundabout's been in for a long, long time, uh, and the development hasn't come through yet, so I think people aren't taking advantage of it yet. But as I can see Paul nodding, and I saw Sir Mrs. B Mrs. Bishop nodding as well. So that I completely understand your comments regarding uh, the flow of it, but that is the way the traffic should be going through the new spine road, which this loop road will be coming off. That's helpful, thank you, because I agree with Councillor Morley that I can never yet get that roundabout right, and I've always thought it's put in there to stop me to make me slow down um, when I try to shoot through there, uh, which he does, but it works, yes. Um, but anyway, that's, that's all the robust debate I think we need on this one. Um, any other comments? If not, can I have a proposal and a seconder, please? Councillor Rice, Councillor Whitcroft, all those in agreement? Uh, Councillor Alloway not speaking to us? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, members. That's unanimous. Um, and now on to the next item on um, which item seven on page ninety-five, uh, Princess Royal Barracks again, and this is the one that Mrs. Bishop mentioned. So um, over to you, Mrs. Uh, declarations again. I think it's the same declarations before we've had correspondence. Uh, any other declarations on this? No. Nope. Thank you, Mrs. Bishop. Right, so going from highway infrastructure to serve dwellings, we're now going to um, open space and recreation. And this relates to Blackdown Road, uh, the recreation ground and the playing field, which is up here. So you have the play space here, you have the recreation ground here. Now, all of this area here is going to be part of alternative natural green space. So this will all become public space. The main proposals this evening relate to linking, apart from changing the, confirming the use, is to put the pedestrian link in here, so you can get from the playing field to the top of parcel X here, and also for the new footpath, new footpath and cycleway down here. And hopefully that should show. And this is an aerial photo. Um, so this is the existing playing field. Um, you've got obviously you've got Blackdown Road, Bellew Road, and you've also got Wood End Road over here. This is Deepcut Bridge Road. So all of this area here is going to become public open space. Uh, here are a couple of uh, views from pub, uh, the public realm. This is on Deepcut Bridge Road, looking in. Um, this is where the footway cycleway will come out uh, at its southern end. Uh, this is within the site, just looking at the back of the gates. And then we're going to the other end by Blackdown Road playing field and the recreation ground. So this is the area that's going to be hard surfaced. And this is the playing field. Uh, as you'll see from the report, um, the original hybrid permission secured the playing field and the, re and the recreation ground to be retained in its current form. So no proposals are changing here. Um, but you'll note from the report that there is a financial contribution to be paid by the developer towards the upgrade to the council um, for the upgrading of that play space in due course. So these are the two proposals that we have. Now, one of the things I will say is that we have got a significant change in levels and we have a lot of trees on this site, as you can see from the aerial photo. So in the issue that we have uh, so this is the link from the playing field into Parcel X here. There is an existing um, track there, and that's going to be part. That's also going to be a, a footway come cycleway. But to all intents and purposes, notwithstanding it's currently dug up for the substation that, uh, that's being put, put in, um, that's what its use will be. So we have the footway cycleway this way, and we also have the footway cycleway here. Now there is a very very steep change in level here. This is high, this is low. Uh, as you'll see from the report, um, we did a site visit with the County Highway Authority and the tree officer. And whilst we're generally happy with the locations of the, the two paths, we think that there are opportunities to retain more trees and to also to make sure that we uh, deal with the levels properly. Um, so you will see from the report that there are various conditions proposed for that. Let's see, that's not all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you will see from the amendment sheet, there are again a number of, of changes. Um, either information wasn't submitted to us or the information that we did have we weren't happy with. So you will see from the amendment sheet, we are reimposing conditions to, again, to do with trees, um, also landscape management, to make sure that, again, the development is fit for purpose in accordance with the deep cut vision. Uh, again, uh, keeping our green spaces, making sure that it's appropriate in terms of tree retention, managing the site levels properly. Um, and the recommendation is to grant subject to the conditions set out on the amendment sheet and in the agenda report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, 
I think we've got a new word here. We? we have an angst. I'm not sure if everybody appreciated what an angst was before, well, this meet, this context. Um, but uh, I was trying to work out what the T is, accessible natural green space standards. It must be the second word. But anyway, that's me. Yeah. Councillor Rise. I think Councillor Deech wanted to speak as Ward Councillor. That was on the previous item, Chairman. Very, uh, very briefly. Councillor Deech, same comments we yeah, yeah. relate to you. Yeah, pretty, right, for pretty, the, those listening, Councillor Deech. Yeah, pretty, pretty much the same as before, except to say, I would just li uh, like to say that what, they've, what the developer has delivered so far in terms of the, the central sangs has been very high quality. Um, the uh, play area, although it had its problems in the early days, and there are still some issues outstanding, it is high quality. Um, this, uh, my concern actually was with the levels too, and making sure that it was uh, going to be accessible as a footpath uh, and cycle route. Um, I think it will be. Um, and again, yeah, I'd just like uh, members to support this. Um, they, they, we're, we're heading towards a very high quality environment from what I can see. Um, and I'd like to thank our officers for, for uh, being very uh, judicious, let's say, in making sure that that is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deech. Members, Councillor Rise. Thank you, Chair. Just regarding the playground, which is Wood End playground, but it's obviously within the site. I was wondering, as it's included within the site boundary, can the officer just confirm whose responsibility the playground is? Is it Surrey Heath Borough Council or is it the DIO? Um, short answer, both actually. It's owned by DIO, but we have had a lease on it since at least 20 years. So we look after it as it stands. Um, and the intention in terms of the uh, Section 106 agreement that goes with the hybrid permission is that ultimately it will be transferred to the council anyway. Um, so one way or the other, it will become it, it will be us, and it is us, but it's also DIO at the moment. And is there any financial contribution as a part of this coming specifically for the play area? Yes, yes, there is. Councillor Wheeler. Thank you, Chair. Just check it. Oh, we'll transfer it back over here. We seem to be a long way apart, don't we? Um, it was just to, to check that, uh, is it Surrey Wildlife Trust that's going to be responsible for the woodland here, or is it us? So much, and I am fully in support of the retention of trees. Some grow a lot faster than others. Um, and I suppose it's understanding the management plan that we have in place for those trees to make sure uh, that they don't become a nuisance. Uh, as you'll see from the update report, we weren't happy with the landscape management plan that was submitted. So we've reimposed the condition to make sure we get one with, that we do like. Um, it's also something that we will look at because ultimately, if it is going to be us, we need to make sure that it, it reflects the council's objectives in terms of climate change, uh, biodiversity. So there's a lot of things for us to look at and we're making sure that it gets covered off properly. Because presumably when the 106 and the hybrid 106, climate change and biodiversity weren't really on the horizon. No, they weren't. But obviously the council has objectives. We have design guidance in term, and we have policies that promote biodiversity so and also we have the national planning policy framework and all planning decisions are taken in accordance as members know so um, they're going to do it thank you members proposal and seconder please councillor rise and we'll go councillor betton all those in agreement thank you members that is unanimous thank you very much indeed now on to next item item Eight, um, one three four, one three six, London Road, Bagshot. Um, any declarations on this before I? Uh, um, now this is one that has been before us in the past, 
and we are looking at its reserved, it was held back reserved matter uh, for landscaping issues only, I believe. Uh, Ms. Turney will no doubt confirm that's the case. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, as just pointed out, the PROSE application seeks planning permission for the approval of reserved matters and landscaping only in connection with the outline application. So that was previously for the erection of 26 units. So just as the background, then, the, the principle of development and the access has been considered acceptable under the outline application. So this outline consent is for approval to the... The outline consented the approval for the full details of the access, the layout, the scale and appearance of the development. So this application is for the landscaping only. So as I go through the development, uh, the slides, there is, there is one update as well. So the site is located within the settlement area of Bagshot. The site is, the site is located at the eastern side of the London Road. The site currently includes two detached dwellings. To the east and south of the site is a, is a recent housing development, and then to the to south of the site is the overflow car park for the retail site. As also to the, north, to the north of the site, within here, is a protected tree. So this is an image currently of the front of the site, so these are where the two existing accesses are, and that one's obviously to be closed up. And then these are some images that are shown from the southwestern elevation. So this is where the car parking area is. Um, so there is currently existing um, vegetation which falls outside of the application site and the existing boundary fence which runs alongside. These are some images then um, of the, the north, north side of the site. So the, one, the first image is from the inside of the site. So you can see the existing hedging and the houses to the rear. And then I've tried to get up close so you can see there is an existing boundary fence that runs along that um, boundary as well. And then the last image is taken from outside of the site to show that those residential houses have that boundary fence running along the side. These are the rear of the site. Um, so the first two images are taken from within the site, um, look, looking down. And then again, the, one, the last one is from outside of the site, which shows a parking area to the residential area where you can see um, there is existing vegetation but also another boundary fence. So the landscaping scheme would include new, new landscaping to the front of the site with new hedging and three additional trees. To the northern corner up here would be a planting area and the, nor the northern boundary would be fenced with a mixture of hedging and planting areas to the front. As mentioned earlier, there is an existing boundary fence that runs along here. To the east of the site is an existing hedge that is to be retained and reinforced. To the southern boundary adjacent to the car park will be the fence with a mixture of hedging and a planting area to the front. Perimeter planting areas are proposed adjacent to the building footprints. Planting areas are proposed on the approach areas to the buildings and on the frontages of these three buildings. A wildflower area is also proposed under the um, the oak tree, which is here, and lastly, a lawn area provided for the amenity areas. The long-term soft landscaping management includes details of how the existing vegetation will be removed and protected, details of the proposed tree planting, including staking, watering, which will include fortnightly watering through the spring and autumn period and two times a week in the summer. Proposed management of the new trees is incl includes the guard, the pruning, proposed hedging details and the long-term management of the plans, which in includes the trim to an A-shape form and the native mixed species of hedges will be used and maintained to a height of 1.2 metres. Further details of the wild flowering management and grass areas are provided. So during the course of the application, additional information was submitted uh, for the tree protection um, during the construction. These details relate to a cellular confinement system and the council's arboricultural officer has suggested a condition which has been reworded and agreed by the applicant. The application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you very much. Members. Councillor Morley. 
Can I just ask, uh, do we think that the watering scheme is going to be sufficient should we have another summer like this summer, next summer? <laughs> or whenever these are planted? Or do we need to put something additional in in case of 40 degrees, etc.? I think I'd say that's quite a, a rare thing to happen. Um, and the Arbor Officer has reviewed the details and considers that those technical details would be sufficient um, for the, the plants. The, the landscaping condition would be worded, yeah, that within five years they would need to be replaced as well, yes. Council Rise. Thank you, Chair. Just regarding the wildflower planting under the tree, um, I'm all for wildflower planting, and I'm just wondering what is the effectiveness of wildflower planting in a residential development? Obviously, wildflower, is, is there an expected biodiversity net gain because of this wildflower planting? And are we confident that it, the management plan and uh, that there is a, this, a suitable protection in place that will prevent it from being turned into a car park because residents may see it as not maintained green space? Um, I think because it's under that protected tree is why they've obviously considered that location suitable. Um, but it'd be clearly marked that that'd be a wild flowering area and I wouldn't expect that you would be able to park a vehicle on there. So I'd be satisfied that that area would be maintained as it is um, and that would be the condition in place that if it was damaged, it would need to be replaced within five years as well. And just the point regarding the biodiversity net gain is that has, has during the application process and I apologize if it's in the uh, report uh, I'm just wondering has that been identified by the applicant as a reason for wildflower planting in this uh, in this location or is it just because they wanted to do wildflower planting off the top of my head I don't think it's been specifically specified that's the reason it's very good for bees <laughs> and attract bees and insects and hay fever for those who suffer it. Sorry. So often the planting schemes um, that are end up with new developments tend to be just green shrubs and no flowers. So it's lovely to hear something that the bees will like. I agree. Members, any other comments? If not, propose this. I'm going to, I'm going to propose this one. I like the sound of the wildflower. Is there a seconder? Councillor Morley, all those in agreement? Thank you, members. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. That is the end of the... Uh, thank you, those watching on, on YouTube. That's the end of the um, formal part of the meeting. We now go into a um, private section to consider uh, items uh, which are confidential. And therefore, I will... The um, press and public are excluded now from the meeting uh, during consideration of the item uh, planning enforcement priority cases as it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 1 and 3 of part 1 of the Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972. That's agreed, is it? Thank you.